All right, so I'll just jump into it. Um, hello, uh, my name is Jem, as you know, and um, I work at Occupant Fonts, uh, which is owned by Morisawa, um, a Japanese type foundry. Um, here's our team. I work with four other colleagues, uh, Marie Otsuka, Cyrus Seismith, and Jun Shin. Um, we're based in Providence, Rhode Island, and um, funny enough, uh, everyone in our office went to Rhode Island School of Design, and we also teach there, so there is kind of a good connection between the university and our, um, and our office. Um, so since this is a type design conference, um, I decided to start my presentation with the classical trope um, regarding positive and negative spaces between the letters. Um, as you might know, the topic of negative space or the space between the letters is an extremely sensitive issue for um, type designers. And um, this is mainly because the shape of the negative space plays uh, as big of a role in shaping the letter as the letters themselves. Uh, however, um, today I would like to use this um, as an analogy for my type design practice. Um, uh, so for the purposes of this talk, um, I'll consider the positive space, the letters themselves, as my type design practice, and the negative space, which is everything else I do outside of type design that helps shapes my practice, basically. So um, maybe I'm not going to talk about type that much, but I'm going to um, in a roundabout way, uh, going to define some of the influences that um, helps us uh, make our design decisions. So I get this question a lot. Um, what is your practice? And um, the answer is almost always, uh, I don't really know. And I don't really know because um, I'm still working on defining what my practice is since it's changing every day. So for today's purposes, I prepared a small map of what's kind of going on in my life. And um, uh, I won't have enough time to cover this whole map today, obviously. It's, uh, so don't be intimidated by the complexity of this. I mean, the, it's kind of the point that it's a little bit complex. Um, however, I'll, I'll take you through uh, a, a, a couple different routes. and. Let me just begin by um, dissecting some of these modules really quickly. Um, so the green ones that are highlighted here are the current typefaces or some of the past typeface projects that I've um, uh, worked on. And uh, as you could already see, they're in minority to the overall kind of mind map that I have here. Um, the magenta ones uh, are uh, basically representing uh, my ongoing or recently finished projects such as uh, books or teaching or whatnot. And the cyan ones are uh, basically um, my playtime and uh, some extracurricular activities that I pursue either with the occupant crew or by myself. So today we are going to be able to only um, look at this part and um, well, actually, Onurbe, if you invite me in the future again, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to complete the map. <laughs> but I have only 30 minutes, so I, I, I don't want to pack everything in. Okay, so i um, just going to jump in on the first path, or for, for the purposes of this conference, I'll, we'll, we'll call, the, call, call these axes, I guess. Um, when I started in Occupant Fonts, my uh, very first task was to expand uh, this typeface called Heron Serif. And I, I, I was basically tasked to draw Cyrillic and Greek. And this was an extremely tough task for me because I don't speak any of these languages that uses these scripts. Uh, however, I was really lucky because my coworker, June, was also responsible of doing the same exact thing, but for another typeface. So we kind of started in the same time learning about Greek and Cyrillic. I mean, we directly jumped into the research just uh, through, at first, printing as many typefaces as possible to see uh, what's out there and try to get our eyes acquainted. And then uh, we learned basically the underlying structures of these languages. Um, we're super lucky because we have the Providence Public Library right next to our office, which houses um, uh, the Uptight collection, which is one of the biggest um, type uh, specimen collections in the world. So this is this was very lucky. So we kind of like uh, visited the Uptight collection to see 
uh, more historical examples of Cyrillic and Greek, basically. I mean, we also, of course, hit a wall, and I, I believe this is very common amongst type designers. I'm still kind of uh, in the beginning phase of my career here, so not sure how common this is. But we were asking ourselves, do we even have the right to draw these scripts? Because we, didn't, we do not belong to these cultures, so uh, we were kind of concerned about ethical issues. And very quickly, we found ourselves dealing with the politics of the Cyrillic script. What characters do Bulgarians like? What characters do Serbians feel comfortable with? And of course, there is already heated discussions online uh, regarding all of these. So we were just trying to observe as much as possible. And also, which characters to draw? I mean, Cyrillic, from what I remember, uh, is used by 80 plus languages. So we were like, OK, how, how many edge cases are we going to support? We didn't really have any standards because Occupant Fonts was just starting at that time. As the, as the new office with the four of us. You know, but thank God we had uh, a good um, network of um, mentors and we worked with Ilya Ruderman, uh, really helped us um, kind of lay the foundation for Cyrillic, whereas uh, Jerry Leonidas, uh, who might be here maybe, uh, no, he's not, okay, uh, helped a lot uh, with um, Greek. So as you could see, this topic is kind of extremely dry and in intellectually demanding. So we started to distract ourselves with something that started as a small game. And uh, this was particularly possible since we were looking at these foreign shapes. And as we were sensitive to the white space, our imaginations would start playing this, this game with us. So um, here is uh, Mr. Frog that I kind of uh, drew just by looking at these pairs and just randomly sent it to my team over Slack. And um, next thing you know, one thing leads to another. We're um, printing out our proofs and drawing bunnies inside the Omega and like the conversations are now kind of more heavy on the ears of the bunnies or um, the expression, you know? And of course we had this uppercase German double S, which kind of sneaked into the standards a couple or two or three years ago, I guess, uh, which we had to add it to our font. This is, a, this is a new character that Germany decided to make official, I guess. And um, we were drawing these, these dudes and the, the discussion was, okay, like what's the, what's the correct hairstyle for this, for this negative shape, basically. Of course, uh, June came in later and said, oh no, it's a, it's a, it's a penguin, it's not a, it's, it's not a guy. And I was spacing the five and uh, didn't, couldn't stop and notice that there's a really cute relationship between the, the bunny and the dog basically looking at each other. So I, I, I of course directly sent it to the team and five, five seconds later, Cyrus sends me this drawing uh, basically, he was coincidentally working on the double S as well, uh, lowercase, and drew, drew this bird. This is something I, I dug down again in, in the Slack messages someday. I don't know, one, one of us must have sent it. It's, I think it's a mouse. Maybe it looks a little bit clearer like this. So sometime last year, Morisawa asked us to design a type specimen and uh, because they were participating on a to a conference by Adobe and they wanted to have our work there. So at that time, um, we basically attended too many conferences and we collected a lot of uh, type specimens and we were kind of tired of looking at these and we really didn't feel like making another type specimen because especially Cyrus Field uh, felt like people would um, kind of forget these specimens in their hotel rooms and whatnot. Um, so basically, instead of a specimen, we decided to uh, make a board book for children, and um, it's called How to Speak Rooster. And we wanted to teach kids different sounds that roosters make in different countries because, because we thought, why not? Why not just do that instead of a... Um, so this is basically the, the first page. Um, here the, the rooster says coco doodle doo and the French, le coq, says cocorico, and we had Icelandic with an amazing word, gagala gagala goo. And also, obviously, I worked there, so we had to sneak in the Turkish, so and 
I mean, the jazz roosters are amazing, so I was like, all right, this is, this is definitely making it in the book. Um, and of course, like the last page, we, we wrote what the typefaces were to, to draw those things, you know, because we were, we were thinking about these animals. And uh, basically, sorry, we, we thought that this would be a good gift if someone received a specimen and went back home, they would have a gift for their nieces or nephews or kids and stuff like that. It would be generous. Um, yeah, I mean, and also another thing that we thought was um, the kids would read this and maybe in 10 or 15 years if they become graphic designers, they would be super loyal customers of Occupant Phone. So, uh, I mean, we're, we're still counting on this business model for our, for our typeface, for, for, for our type family, sorry. But I, I, actually what made me really happy is that this didn't really stay in the boundaries of, of conferences. You know, th th this book started really um, circulating and oh I actually have some copies here so I could give you some if you find me during the break so I think I think my point is that a, a, li a little joke that we took too seriously kind of ended up with this super beautiful project that we really like and we, we keep printing new um, editions of it so all right I'm going to jump into the next chapter I guess um, I was looking at my slack history the other day and I found this um, message that I sent. Uh, hello, I had had a bit of a brain melt today, so I spent two hours making posters for Occupant Forms. Um, basically, I love making random posters, especially when I'm not under pressure. I like to work really fast and, fast and messy, and when I want to take a break from type design or it's just too much kerning or whatever, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm just not going to work today. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make some posters. And this is, the, the, this is a consistent, actually, practice that I have. Um, and for this exercise, I decided to focus on the fact that Occupant Fonts is in the States and we're, we're based in Providence. Uh, so I was just playing with some ideas. Very quickly, um, Amira is a typeface that I really liked. So it's like United States of Amira. Bad joke, haha. Um, then I obviously lost track because I wasn't really paying attention to the content, so I just started making these specimens, basically. So, you know, all of these, hap like, all of these stuff that I'm telling you uh, are, is happening in this building, actually, that we call the Providence Design Office, uh, or short uh, uh, DO. And we are basically a co-working design space, and it's actually not similar to WeWork, or the other more corporate um, collaborative spaces because uh, all of the members have a heavy hand in running the space. And we have a lot of um, collaborative activities that we do in the space. For example, here we're like recycling old magazines into pins and I eat a lot of chocolate so I wanted to recycle my trash into pins and maybe someone would wanna wear that. Um, and here, this is also a super fun activity that like we kind of started um, as the occupant phones group and on some Wednesdays we would put out these huge sheets of paper and we would ask everyone in the in the space to basically maybe take a break if, if they could and come and uh, come and draw with us and we usually try to bring like unusual drawing tools like things that are too thick or things that we like want to buy from the art store. So this is like a great reason to buy like a new marker or something like that. Oh, and this one, um, we, we made uh, ruling pens out of, out of cans and just like created these really beautiful drawings. Um, okay, so back to the posters. Um, the design office had a photo shoot coming up and um, there was going to be this article by AIGAI on design. They, they, they wanted to talk about the future of collaborative spaces or whatnot. And uh, basically our back room was um, empty. So what happened is that since I had all of these um, posters, what we did is just in an afternoon, just printed them and like made this beautiful wall, um, which I was really happy about because uh, basically the thing that I was passing time got super useful and like, got published. Um, this is another one. It was too big to fit in there, so um, we kind of put it next to the uh, flat uh, file cabinet. Um, something else that we do that I'm super excited about, actually, is um, every Tuesday night, as a team, we go to life drawing events. 
um, at Occupant Fonds, just four of us. Um, if you're in Providence, it's from 5.30 to 8, you could come with us. Uh, so we, we basically draw the human body because it's, it's a lot more complicated than drawing like the, 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 the simple uh, outlined letters. And um, basically, I, I made this stupid rule with myself of that I would draw the same thing uh, a couple times, but I, I would draw my drawings so that the, the drawings would get more and more abstract as I go. You know, and I think the, the fun thing about this is that the sketches actually never stay in the sketchbook because this is just for me, this is just a area for me to collect raw material. So I uh, basically started, I mean, as I was saying, I was making these posters and I was like, okay, now I have all of, like, all of these sketchbooks filled with these drawings that we do, I'll just take my iPhone and start photographing them or whatever and then start to put these things on, on the new series of posters that I do um, in order to procrastinate my type design job, basically. Oh, and um, Heron, which I was working for the Cyrillic and Greek, was actually originally um, commissioned by the Mount's Health magazine um, and just uh, be, because I was looking at that, I was like, okay, maybe I should uh, draw the Mr. Olympiad or something like that. And al also made my own version of Men's Health magazine, Morisawa. Never saw the day, but it's here now, I guess. Lastly, um, I want to talk about um, this other weird experience that I had um, while I was designing Heron. And this is actually... Um, a funny story regarding kerning, and um, I'll just explain what kerning is real quick for the people who are not familiar with. It's, it's a very easy concept, basically. So basically, all of the letters that we draw are, in, are drawn inside a box, and as you type, all of these boxes get kind of put next to each other, so this is how you make words. And in this case, the word pat looks great, but if you have a word like patates, and uh, as you could see, the P A T A T looks a lot more spacious than the T E S. And what we do as type designers is kind of like squish that together, right? Um, so here's like the boxes, and here's this is like the overlap. Um, so basically, this process happens manually, um, which wasn't a very big problem for me when I was learning how to do this, but when I started doing Heron, which is a huge family, this started becoming a little bit annoying uh, because I'll just explain the numbers. I, I just wanted to look at the numbers for this speech. For, uh, for this speech. Um, so Heron has um, 20 styles, and um, every style, thanks to our expansion, has 800 characters. So. In total, we have 16,000 characters in the, in, the, um, in the family. And even in one style, there are 640,000 possible um, pairs that we have to kind of look at and see if they need this uh, little adjustment. Uh, and if you look at the whole family, then that kind of makes 12.8 million characters, which is a lot. Um, but Thank God there are some ways to dramatically reduce this problem. First of all, we don't really kern um, different scripts with each other, right? Um, which drops the number dramatically to back to 2.5 million pairs that we need to look at. And also there is another technology that allows us to group stuff. So we look at these characters, for example, and say, well, V kind of looks like W. So we could assume that if we kern the V to the O like that, uh, we could safely assume that W and W circumflex would also work. That dramatically, again, uh, lowers the number to 96.6 thousand. And there's one more trick, um, which these are all the weights in Heron in for, for one width. So if I current the lightest and the heaviest, um, basically um, the computer program would could interpolate between these weights and give me uh, the kerning values in between. So that reduces from 20 something million to 10,000 pairs, but still try to imagine doing this for 10,000 times. 
this is the photo that I submitted to the, um, to, to the conference. As you could see, I'm kind of clean shaven and looking out from the frame, very hopeful from life. And after kerning, um, I was doing some self portraits and um, you could see that I'm turning into a caveman and also um, depression is kind of settling in a little bit uh, because it's, 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 it's a very demanding task obviously. And now the story has a good connection to the DO, to the design office. Um, this is, this is my desk arrangement. Um, I sit next to Marie, which is another designer at Occupant Fonts, but across from me is Jen, who is an architect, and right next to me is Nick, who is a computer scientist, and we don't work together, but we sit together. And what's funny is that they basically observed me grow my beard and go kind of slide under my desk as I go through the 10,000 pairs or whatever. And Nick, being a computer scientist, and we were having lunch one day, we were like, dude, it is, 2019, you know, we could, we could get toilet paper from our phones just by asking it, you know, like, I can't believe we're still doing 10,000 pairs by hand. This is, this is just ridiculous. We have to figure out anyway. Um, so Nick was at the time was working with machine learning with art, with artificial intelligence and said, you know what, maybe we could kind of put something together and like train a computer to, to current this for us or something like that. And I was like, oh, is that really possible? Like, let's, 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 talk, let's think about that. Um, so we started meeting in the weekends and at nights just to tr try to kind of patch this program. And um, I was giving him more information about how kerning works and all the exceptions and things like that. And he was like, okay, this, is, th this looks promising. Um, in the end, we tested it with uh, just an uppercase to uppercase allium thin. On the top, it was kerned by Cyrus. And um, MILK, which is the name of our tool, it stands for machine learning kerning, um, uh, kerned it pretty, pretty close to the result, actually. So we were, we were, su we were super happy about it. And um, what happened is that we put together a very quick document and pitched it to Morisawa and said, hey, we, we came up with this tool basically uh, during the weekends and at nights could you give us some money to uh, basically develop this? And they were like, okay, we, we could give you an initial kind of uh, prototype and um, hopefully it'll be, we'll, we're going to release a very basic prototype of this tool in ATIPI Tokyo. Um, and it's, it's, it's in September, so we have three months, so it's a little bit tight schedule. Um, so while I was preparing this talk, this pursuit of kind of trying to design my own unique way of practice um, reminded me of the years that I used to live here, actually. Um, in our day-to-day -day life, we have um, a, lot of, a lot less rigorous systems, uh, like, I don't know, random unreliable traffic lights on smaller streets, so on and so forth, which really requires us to have um, a lot of agency and imagination in order to navigate the landscape. And, I really, really, really enjoyed the fact that uh, everything is up for negotiation here, you know. Um, this is a photo that I really like to show my design students back in RISD. It's um, a model of a playground that was designed by the Japanese-American sculptor Isomu Noguchi. And his idea was to design an abstract landscape so that the kids who play here would have no choice other than to invent their own ways of, of play. Um, in a way, through playing here, the kids would have uh, would be given an agency to create their own make-believe worlds, basically. And s similarly, I try to keep myself in this more abstract uh, practice landscape so that I have more agency on the paths that I take. So um, if I feel constrained by the current conditions of a system like kerning that was designed by former generations, I should be able to take charge and ask questions to redefine the entire process, or at least have a reflex to change it and just not just say, okay, I'll just do the 10,000 pairs or whatever. I mean, it's, I think it's, it's, it's part of design and it's, it's, part, it's part of our jobs to, to, to question these systems and we, we should have platforms to do this. Here's another playground that I like to show to my students. It's, this one is a brutal playground. Um, I go back to this image from time to time and kind of imagine myself running around here as a kid. 
and I, f I feel like if I fell, I would really hurt my knee or something. So I should be always awake and aware of my surroundings while I'm playing. Um, I like to believe that this is uh, why when I drew the Mr. Frog, I took it extremely seriously, um, just because I knew the things I do as a joke or not could present a new opportunity for an unexpected project or um, it just means that if I'm doing it for fun, it means that it should be a, a serious thing. That's the, that's the way that I should go towards. Uh, so I always try to remind myself to enjoy the chaos and if, if the chaos is not uh, there, I try to create chaos and take play seriously. Um, yeah, anyways, this is, I think, it's, this is it from me. Uh, thank you so much for um, having me here. And um, please find me during the break if you have any questions. I'd be really happy to talk to you uh, about my life there, about my experiences. And um, I'll be more than happy to answer them as best as possible. Çok teşekkürler. Çok sağ olun beni aldığınız için.